Our scripture reading this morning comes from from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. Hear now our Pentecost reading. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya beyond the Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Every once in a while when I'm having trouble getting started on a sermon, I'll, I'll, look for, I'll look through Google Images to get a little inspiration when I'm lacking it. Because, you know, they say a picture says a thousand words. And sometimes when you read a scripture, you just need to visualize it. You just need to see what somebody else might be thinking because the words just, they don't give it to you. And for that reason, I think that kids' Bibles often have gotten this right. You know, I wish it was really acceptable for me to, to pull up a chair at, at one of my classes and, and reach into my backpack and grab out a nice kids' Bible with, with color and, and pictures and, and diagrams and, and just all sorts of good stuff instead of having to just grab my plain old Bible with black and white. Today's scripture... It's one of those stories where reading it just doesn't do it justice. It's like when you read, the, read about Noah's Ark. You understand it's a big ark. They make that clear. It fits all, all of the animals. You understand it's big. But until they made that replica, I don't think we really understood how big the ark was. And I think that changes a lot about what we think when we actually see the size of it. This week I needed to see a picture of the wind rushing. I needed to see a picture of the, the tongues of flames descending on the people and touching their heads. I needed to see a picture of all this chaos that I read about. You see, I, 
I think the storyteller is trying to show us that there's chaos, that this is not a pretty picture. Because not only is there wind in this story, it's a violent wind. And it isn't a violent wind outside, it's a violent, a violent wind inside their house. It's a violent wind inside the house. And then there's these tongues of fire. And these tongues of fire are, are swept up inside of a violent wind inside of a house. And not only is this tongues of fire inside this house, but they're resting now on every single person's head. And then they start talking in crazy languages. I'm reading this and I'm like, this is going to be a great picture. I'm going to find lots of great examples of what this looks like. But then I do my Google search. And I see these nice, beautiful paintings, really well done. And I encourage you to Google Pentecost and go to the images section on Pentecost sometime. And you'll see what I'm saying. But, but all the pictures of Pentecost were these people calmly sitting there with their hands folded, praying all nice and gentle. Their hair is perfectly straight down. The tongues of fire that I'm imagining are whipping everywhere have been turned into little tiny flames above their heads. I mean, it's really disappointing. It is really disappointing. There's no wind. There's no confusion. It's just a nice, neat little picture. I mean, come on, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's coming down in flame and tongues, and the people are just sitting there like everything is okay. People are understanding everything everyone's saying, and people are like, yeah, that makes sense. That's normal. I don't buy it. Imagine never being able to understand a word of German in your life. And the person you are with is speaking German. And then five minutes later, you understand everything they say. You're telling me you're not going to be a little scared? A little concerned that you might be going crazy? Come on, that's not the story at all that I saw in those paintings. But I think that's the story of Pentecost that we like. We like a sanitized Pentecost. We like a stripped down Pentecost. We like a birthday candle type of Pentecost. The Pentecost I saw in the pictures is the Pentecost I think we desire. Because notice what happens to Pentecost when you, stri when you strip away the wind. When you take away the tongues of fire engulfing people's heads, when you take away the confusion and the fear that they have, what are you left with on Pentecost? You're left with just a group of people with a little flame above their head. We are left with a picture in which they can still claim because of the flame that the Holy Spirit is there. We are left with a picture in which the Holy Flame if we want it to, can be blown out as easy as a birthday candle. That's what we're left with, and I think that's what we like. We like a little flame above our heads, but not enough to consume us. The picture of Pentecost that we paint is the one that we often live. We want a Pentecost that looks good, but doesn't do a whole lot. We want the Holy Spirit, but we don't want it to actually do anything in our lives. Think about it. Do you want the Holy Spirit to fill you up? And before you answer that, I'm talking about this Holy Spirit I just read about. Not the Holy Spirit of the pictures I saw, but the Holy Spirit in Acts. I'm going to pray today and I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, please rain down upon us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this room. And when I say that, are you imagining tongues of fire and violent winds? Or are you imagining 
the Holy Spirit that flickers like a birthday candle. Notice what the Holy Spirit actually does in Acts 2. First thing the Holy Spirit does in Acts 2 is moves us from the house to the community. It's a Holy Spirit that moves us from inside to outside. It's the Holy Spirit that moves us from individuality to community. When we pray for the Holy Spirit, is, is this what we desire? Imagine being in that room, a room that, that is filled with violent winds, a room that has fiery tongues thrashing about, and you can't tell me you want to stay in that room. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It moves us out into the world. See, with all those pictures that I was seeing, they were all sitting there in their nice little rooms. Because that's what we want. That's what I want. I just want to stay in my nice little room here. I don't want the Spirit to move me out. To make us be in community. But that's what it does. It's so violent and so impressive that we can't handle being in this room. What would it look like for us as a church to pray for a Holy Spirit so violent and intense that we just had to leave the room. I think that's the kind of Holy Spirit we need in this world. One that is so intense that we just got to get out of the pews. We can't take it any longer. I got to be in the world. You see, this room is too small to contain the Holy Spirit. But it's just fine for a birthday candle. This is the first thing the Spirit is doing in there. It's moving people into the world. What else does it do? Well, they start hearing other languages. Many people in this say it's a, a reversal of the Tower of Babel. And you know the Tower of Babel where, where the Israelites were getting all uppity with themselves. And so they said, well, we're going to build this really tall tower that reaches up to God. And God said, nope. I'm going to confuse all of your languages. So you can't work together. Some say Pentecost is a reversal of that, but I'm not sure that's right. You see, a reversal would say that now everyone has the same language, that we can all, we all just speak English, or they're all just speaking Hebrew, or, or Aramaic, or something like that. That's not what happens. No, what happens at Pentecost is the Holy Spirit makes every single voice have worth. It gives every voice the power to proclaim the gospel. It gives importance to every tongue in every tribe. You see, the Holy Spirit is a spirit that, that doesn't give us one voice, but gives us many voices. And says that they can all understand each other. When we pray for the Holy Spirit, do we want a Holy Spirit that helps us understand those who have a different voice than us? That have a different culture than us? That have different passions than us? That have different views on political issues? Do we want a Holy Spirit that helps us understand those who have a different voice than us? Do we want a Holy Spirit that says that their voice actually has worth? That they too can spread the gospel message? I think this world needs a Holy Spirit that helps us understand each other. Not just to hear each other, not just to listen, but to truly understand people. And that's hard. That's hard work to do the understanding. Got to actually have conversations with people of different views to understand them. To understand them, we might have to see them as having worth. We might have to see that person on the side of the road's voice 
is just as necessary for God's plan as my voice is here. But I think that's the Holy Spirit we need. The Holy Spirit that gives importance to every voice, to children and to the adults, to the rich and to the poor, to the Republican and the Democrat. To the person from Mexico, the same as the person from England. The Holy Spirit I read about in Acts 2 is one that gives not just one voice, but gives importance to all voices. And is that a Holy Spirit that we've been praying for? The last thing I want to stress that the Holy Spirit does is it changes us. And this may be the hardest part about the Holy Spirit. It changes us and we don't get a choice in that change. You see, I think the disciples were really happy with their lives before Acts 2. They enjoyed their moment with Jesus. But they were happy going back to their old businesses, back to fishing, back to living their lives, being good Jews. They're back to celebrating the Jewish Pentecost. But notice what happens to these disciples after Pentecost, this group of people who before Pentecost denied Jesus. They denied Jesus three times, it says of Peter. He denied knowing this man because he was afraid of persecution. After Acts 2, we see Peter standing up in front of a thousand proclaiming his faith. This group of disciples once ran away for fear of being associated with Jesus now, in the book of Acts, willingly go to jail. These disciples who were so often confused and lacking understanding now are bringing thousands of people to faith. These disciples are now, in the book of Acts, going to die for Jesus. You see, Pentecost leaves us with one, only one option, and that's to never be the same. The disciples we see in the book of Acts are nothing like the disciples we see in the Gospel of Luke. And it's not because of an empty tomb. It's not because they saw Jesus. It's because when the Holy Spirit grabs you, you can't be the same. This is the Holy Spirit I see in this scripture. A Holy Spirit that moves us into community, that opens the gates of heavens to all voices and experiences, and that forces us to change. And so now knowing that, I ask you again, do you want this Holy Spirit to fill you? Because it doesn't make sense to pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill my life and please keep me the same doesn't make sense that doesn't work but that's what we want that's what we pray that's what I pray we pray out of one side of our mouth Holy Spirit come and out of the other side we say please don't please don't what would it look like if we as a church ditched all the pictures of Pentecost and prayed for a real Pentecost to happen I don't know, but I pray that the Holy Spirit fills the church universal. Because I'm ready for some tongues of fire and violent winds. I think I prayed too often in my life for a birthday candle-sized Holy Spirit. A Holy Spirit that lets me keep doing my thing, doing what I want. A Holy Spirit that just allows me to be myself. A Holy Spirit that when it's convenient for me, I have the power to just blow out. A Holy Spirit that I can wear above my head like a fashion statement. My question to you is, do you really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because if you do, you better watch out. Because I can guarantee your life's going to be a lot more interesting.
Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Amen.